Yeah. Yeah. yeah, good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the lecture about flying and aviation. Hello, <laughs> Fik. <laughs> Welcome on board. This is, uh, this is your captain, Saeed Jaha. But let, let me first tell you how much uh, I'm very glad I'm, I'm here just to address such a distinguished audience of the UFS. And I'm very glad to be back at AUB. I left AUB on May 24, 1972. And today is May 24. So it, it's, it's 40, 46 years since I left AUB. Okay. So 46 years I was in your seats, and now I'm here. It's not much difference, only the age. It's only the age, 46 years ago. Uh, what we'll do today is we'll go through the myths, the facts, and the science of aviation. And the presentation outline will be as such. We'll talk how do airplanes fly, and then frequently ask questions. And then we talk who flies plane and the pilot selection and training. How do we select them? What do they study? And then we go, how safe is flying? Statistics for the last 25 years. And what is the future of aviation looks like? And by the end, we'll leave uh, probably half an hour for questions and answers. <coughs> and hopefully I can answer all your questions. So let's enjoy it and make it fruitful. And I hope I can answer all your questions. Once more, you're welcome <laughs> to the UFS. <laughs> yes, then. Just a little briefing about me. It's 46 years ago since I started, when I left AUB. I've flown around 22,000 hours, over 70 countries. I was a co-pilot at the beginning, and I flew with a captain who is present here. Later on, I'll tell you who is he. And then I was upgraded to your command, as you say, pilot and commander as captain, and I was nominated as a trainee captain who trains pilots. Then I was nominated to a Czech captain, that you Czech pilot, and then I was nominated as the chief ground instructor and the fleet captain. I was retired two years ago, but I'm still working at the training center in Middle East Airlines as the chief ground instructor and training and simulators for pilots. So this is all about me. Now. How do airplanes fly? It's, it's, it's not magic, ladies and gentlemen, it's science. Flying is science, it's not magic. If birds can fly, why don't we fly? What do birds have that we don't have? They have brains, we have brains. They have wings, so we don't have wings. So 100 years ago, somebody started to fly with big wings, jumping over the hill. Okay, so we need to have wings. What do wings do for, for a bird? It moves him forward, forward, and it gives him the lift to stay in there. That's the function of wings of a bird. So in the airplane, we split this into two parts. So we have engines that move the aircraft forward, and we created the wings that was designed by a Swiss scientist called Bernoulli, where he found that liquids, when they go fast, the pressure drops. So the wings are designed in a way where the motion of air over the wing is very fast compared to the motion of air under the wing. So the pressure always under the wing is much higher than the pressure over the wing, and that's what holds the airplane. So it's all about wings to keep the airplane in sky and the engines for that aircraft to move forward. So this is how we fly. So it's all about science and not magic. Is that simple or complicated? Simple. It's simple. Okay. So we we'll click here and we see a little video. Did we 
download the videos in the show? Oh, we have them here, okay. Okay. Yeah, this one. How do massive airplanes fly? Some of the largest commercial airliners can weigh over one million pounds. Compare that to today's heaviest flying bird, the Great Buster, which weighs just around 35 pounds. Despite their differences, these two behemoths rely on the same principles of flight. Flight is basically a battle against Earth's gravity, and your greatest ally is the air. Birds and planes alike fight gravity by manipulating the air molecules around them. When birds flap their wings, they're generating an area of high air pressure under the wing and low air pressure above it. The same happens when planes race down the runway. The pressure difference above and below the wing creates a net upward force, giving the aircraft lift. Once this upward force exceeds gravity's downward pull, you have liftoff. Of course, a one million pound plane needs greater lift to get off the ground than a great buster. Planes achieve this with a combination of two things. One, airplanes race down the runway at 150 to 180 miles per hour, creating fast moving air across the wings. And two, something called the angle of attack. You probably noticed that planes tilt up at liftoff instead of rising parallel to the ground. The reason is that the tilt, also known as the angle of attack, directs more air below the wing. This increases the pressure and gives the plane an extra boost. Once aloft, the main thing keeping the plane in midair isn't magic, it's the engines. Engines propel the plane forward, keeping a steady flow of fast moving air across the wings. This creates that key difference in air pressure that supports the plane's weight against gravity. But as you fly higher, the air becomes thinner, so the plane must travel faster to maintain that <laughs> lift. While liftoff speed is around 170 miles per hour at sea level, a commercial airliner's cruising speed is around 550 miles per hour at 40,000 feet, where the air density is 10 times thinner. But a thinner atmosphere means less drag on the aircraft, so the engines can hit high speeds with less fuel. Cruising altitudes between 35 to 40,000 feet are the sweet spot, where pilots can fly as fast as possible while burning the least amount of fuel. Each day, more than two and a half million people in the U.S. hop on a plane, taking to the sky the same way birds have been doing for millennia. Consider that the next time you're given a safety lesson on how to fasten your seatbelt. How do you So it's easy. So it's easy. So we have to fly higher. People say we're afraid of heights. Why don't airplanes just climb to 100 meters and fly there? We have to fly faster. That's, it's all about flying, is to go faster. And to go faster, we have to go higher. When the air is less dense, airplanes can go faster. In a simple way, let's say gravity is less up there. So we have to fly high to get you to destinations as soon as possible. Otherwise, the flight from here to London will take 15 hours. So flying at high altitudes, the idea is to get faster and this is all about flying. But flying about at, at these high altitudes uh, presents some risks. Temperature up there is minus 50 or minus 60 or minus 70 degrees Celsius. 60 degrees below zero. So we have to have a very effective air conditioning system to make the cabin so comfort for you and make the temperature between 20 and 24. Outside the aircraft, the temperature is 60 degrees below zero. So this was solved by air conditioning packs in the airplane. The next problem we face, uh, we face up there is oxygen. We cannot survive at this high altitude. The maximum altitude we can breathe and survive normally is 10,000 feet, around 3,000 meters. Anything above this, we breathe, we fill our lungs, but there is no oxygen. So they have to create something called pressurization. So we have to pressurize the air coming into the cabin and make it similar to the ground atmosphere. Otherwise, we cannot live. And for those who flew at times, when they do the briefing, the cabin crew, they say, if we lose pressurization, get the oxygen mask and hold them. So temperature was, was solved for passenger. Oxygen was solved. But now also we face another problem, was freezing at these altitudes. 
some parts of airplane will freeze at this altitude. So a lot of parts of the aircraft from outside, sensors that give me information to the cockpit has to be heated all the time, part of the wings, windows and all this, so they don't freeze at this altitude. Also the fuel, the freezing temperature of fuel we use is kerosene jet A1 and that fuel will freeze at minus 36 degrees Celsius. So temperature up there is minus 50 or minus 60 or minus 70. That's why the fuel is embodied inside the wings to keep it warmer than outside their temperature. And the fuel is heated at all times, continuously heating the fuel so the fuel doesn't freeze. And if fuel freezes, it cannot be used anymore. So these are the four challenges we face up at the high altitudes. But we have to go up there to go faster. So the problem of temperature, the problem of oxygen, the problem of freezing part of the airplane and the fuel was solved. Okay? Is that, is that, is that simple? Yes. Okay. For any questions, let's write it down. By the end, we'll try to answer all the questions. So these are the frequently asked questions. Why do we fly high? How can we breathe up there? How we can stand such low temperature with the lack of oxygen? And how we keep the airplane from freezing? These are the challenges we face when we fly at high altitudes. Now, the process of selection, how do you select pilots? What do pilots study? <coughs> Excuse me. So selection starts initially by general requirement. There's an age limit to start flying. Education, lately, they have to have a degree from university. Excuse me? Yeah, in the old days it wasn't required. Now it's required to have a degree from university. Mish Adab Arabi music. It has to be something in math, physics, science, computer, or, or whatever. Phys physical education or whatever. So that's a requirement just to raise the standard of pilots. They have to get to universities, and something like AUB, USG, these kind of universities, with a degree in science that will help them in the future. This is the latest requirement. Then go to the medical requirement, a special medical requirement. They do it in Beirut and they do it in London, very strict one. And then you go for competences. They should be good in math, they should be good in physics, they should be good in IQ, they should be good into space aptitude, computer skills, and all this. Excuse me. Microphone. Microphone. Very microphone. Then we have, to do the, we have to do the written examination, which is done at AUB here. So it's at AUB nicely, room 500 initially, for general cognitive ability, educational potential, and the flying ability of pilots. Then we get to the oral, which is about languages and personality evaluation at the West Hall, third floor. And personality became, for the last 20 years, very important for pilots. They get trained for technical information and they get trained for the non-technical information which is much more important. It's very important. You can hold a PhD in math at the AUB, but you're not a good teacher. So license alone and technical information is not alone. The non-technical is, is as important as the technical. And what is the non-technical information? We talk about leadership. Captain is a leader. Decision making, communication, listening, situation awareness, threat and error management, high workload management, and all these things. So all the training now is being stressed on technical knowledge and the non-technical part of the human factor and try that pilots don't do mistakes. Why do people do mistakes? All this is in a human factors training. So those will be accepted and they pass all the exams. 
They go outside. We cannot issue the initial license in Lebanon. We accept only licenses issued in Europe. They can be issued in the United States, but we accept only license issued in Europe under European Air Safety Association. This is the EASA Association in Europe. And all the European licenses are based under EASA restriction and rules. So we adopted to have the European license for our pilots. So we have to send them outside. Initially, we used to go to Scotland, the UK. Now they're going to Jerez in Spain. The weather is a little better than, than Scotland, so they don't delay too much flying because of bad weather. So they go to Spain initially, and for just to get their initial commercial pilot license, it takes 66 weeks, continuous. Continuous, non-stop, 66 weeks of ground school and flying, they will get the initial license. After that, when they come back, what do they study there? What are the subjects that pilots study? We don't study chemistry or biology, or cultural studies, or literature, or whatever. Subjects that we study are these. Aerodynamic and the theory of flight. How do airplanes fly? And then we go to meteorology. I'm a Tessian. A little about astrology also. And then we go to study of airframe, engine system. What are the systems of an aircraft? We have the electrical system, hydraulic system, fuel system, avionics system, pressurization system, auto flight system, all these are systems. So pilots have to study this. Then we talk about the flight instruments, radio communication, navigation. How do pilots go from here to London or New York? How do you navigate? We don't have signs uh, up there like they go on the streets. So this is called navigation. Now we go to flight operation, human factors. Dealing with all aspects of human factors, the non-technical skills that we said. And then the VFR flying, that's flying in, in, in good weather. IFR flying is flying by instrument without looking outside. I can go to New York from here without looking outside. It's just flying by instruments. This is IFR flying. Then I have to talk the air law, Anunotaira. There's international air law, ICAO, and there's something related to the local DCAs, civil aviations in Lebanon. Then we talk mass and balance, the flight planning and the performance of the aircraft. This is the, these are the subjects that they take in grand school. In flying, we start initially with single engine aircraft, probably you've seen some of them around the Beirut airport, small airplane, single engine initially. Then they move to twin engine, aircraft with two engines. Then we'll go on something called multi troop operation course, where there's more, more than one pilot in the cockpit. That's a special course. And we get the jet orientation course for pilots who want to fly aircraft that have jet engines. So this is what they study outside. When they finish and they come to work in the airline, let's say in Middle East Airlines. Now, if we have a training center approved by EASA, we can continue their training. Otherwise, we have to send them either to Airbus in Toulouse or to Seattle, Washington for Boeing aircraft. Unless we have a training center that's been qualified and approved by EASA, we can continue their training here. So what do we do when they come back after the initial license? They have to study, get trained for what type of airplane they want to fly. I'm holding a license to fly one airplane only. So every airline will train their pilots to fly one type of airplane only. They cannot. This, is, this is the law. I have a license to fly one airplane. Because all airplanes are different technically and all these procedures and everything. Every aircraft is different from the other. We hold a license for a specific aircraft. So this can be done either at, at the company itself, if they have an approved training center, or we went to Seattle in 1975 to study the jumbo jet. We didn't have the training center here. Now we have a training center and we can train pilots here. And our training center is approved by EASA. So when they come here, we start initially to get them a Lebanese license. Again, ground course and, and written exam at the Lebanese Civil Aviation Authority. Then they study the air law, specific law for, for Lebanon, and they get the type rating. We have to get them a license to fly either an Airbus 320 or a 330. So those are selected to fly a 320 will have certain course. Others that want to fly a 330 will fly another course. And then we go through the non-technical also. 
which we call the CRM. It's called the Crew Resource Management. That's the courses that deal with non-technical. That talks about communication, decision making, leadership, situation awareness, threat and error management, task sharing, human factors, and workload management. And also they get interviewed by a company that came from Europe. Five days of, of interview with them, and they give us the results for, them, for every pilot, saying that, is he eligible to start flying or not, as a personality. And they talk about opening, empathetic, diffused, oriented, focused, conservative, self-reference, detached, self-contained, and all these factors of non-technical skill to make sure that his personality is fit. Once his personality is fit to start flying, then he goes for the technical side. So far so good? Everybody's happy? Anybody, anybody bored? Shall we dong dong for the cabin crew, coffee, something? Now, once they finish from this, they start flying after the, the grand school. Now, every six months, they have to go to training again, all their life. Because the license is valid for one year. I hold the license, it's valid for one year only. So during, during this year, at six months, I'm grounded one week for a grand course. At the end of the year, I'm grounded two weeks to go through a refresher of grand course, a medical exam, a route check that I get on board. There's an examiner behind me, and he just sits behind all the way to London, comes back, and he checks me. If I pass this route check, then they take me to the simulator. And now we see what is a simulator, which is the most important part of training. Most of the training for pilots is done, apart from normal flying, is about the abnormal flying. About the abnormal flying and failures, which we cannot simulate when you fly with us. So we have to do this on ground, something called simulator, which is 100% duplicate of the cockpit, with all the instruments and all the way it operates. So most of training of pilots, 90% of the training, they are trained to deal with any slight abnormal situation that might happen. Anything can fail in an airplane. Every switch, every gauge, every instrument, every system can fail. So for every failure, there is a written procedure laid down by the manufacturer, by Airbus or Boeing. So we open the book and we follow the procedure. So every six months, there are two days. 10 hours in simulator, getting trained for any possible failure that might happen. And that's what we call recurrent training, and that goes from the time they start until they finish at 64. All the time. All the time. This is our simulator in Middle East Airlines, we have a 320. This is a simulator down there. And this is how it looks from inside. If you go inside a simulator, you won't believe this is a simulator, you think you're flying in an airplane. But from outside, that is a simulator. You get inside, this is a simulator. Captain sits on the left, copilot sits on the right, instructor sits up here. And this is an instructor operating system, he can operate. And I can simulate anything that might happen in an airplane. Flying by day, flying by night, flying at dawn, at dusk, sandstorm, rain, hail, weather, thunderstorms, wind, smoke, fog. So different type of weather, different type of airports, different type of, of runways. Some airports are more difficult than others. So they get the trained here, and then they're trained for any failure that might happen. If you take the electrical system, there are 150 failures that might happen in the electrical system. There is 200 failures that might happen in the engine. There are 100 in auto flight. There is 200 in another system, hydraulic system or whatever. So all these failures has to go through recurrent training every six months. And if pilots pass the route check, the medical and the grand school, they get another license. So every year they get a new license, every year, every year, every year. The license expired after one year. This is how it goes. Good? So what is, what is a flight simulator? What is a flight simulator? A flight simulator is a machine 
that resembles an aircraft cockpit and it simulates the flying experience by being 100% duplicate of an aircraft. It's a duplicate of the cockpit. I don't have seats back there. It's only the cockpit where pilots sit. The flight simulator uses computer-generated images. When I fly in simulator, I fly over AUB. Well, I'll show you a picture of AUB. You see cars moving and all this. But this is not actual. It's computer-generated picture, which is 95% as actual. And the instructor can simulate any flying experience from different weather conditions to different airports to different failures. And if everybody passes, they go to the medical check, which is done at AUB, more strict than the one we have at MEA, and then they get the license renewed. So let's take a flight in a simulator. And let's see it moving. Put it open here. Oh. Yeah. Wait, I did download it. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. It's an A3, A320 simulator. That's the briefing in the cockpit. <coughs> so it's a perfect duplicate of the aircraft itself. We take them to every destination that we fly in a simulator. So we we'll see Dubai, we we'll see London, we we'll see Frankfurt. We just get trained on the route with different type of weather they expect in the Gulf and in Europe, the whole places. Those interested to see a simulator, we can get uh, the clearance for them. I can take you one day. We take permission from security department if they allow. Somebody likes to visit the simulator and see what we do. Free, free.
So it looks like the exact airplane, eh? That's the Airbus A380. Interesting, huh? Two more minutes. That's the simulator from outside, as you see. This is where we get in and get all our training. This machine is around 15 to 20 million dollar simulator. Yeah. And it was this day that's gone back to the world. Yeah. Each is specific for the specific model. Sorry, excuse me? Each is Yes, okay. Okay. Airbus 320 has a simulator, 321, 330, Boeing 737, Jumbo, or whatever. Each simulator. Okay, not talking about common myths about flight safety. Safety is a concern of everyone who flies or who thinks of flying. So, 
People think flying is dangerous. People say pilots don't do actually much when they fly. Or they say airplanes crash because of technical problem. Or plane crashes are very common around the world. How, how safe is to fly? It's safer than sitting here. Sitting here is more dangerous. Now we see statistics for the last 25 years. What are risks for human beings against flying? You know this hero? You know this guy? You saw this in cinema? Sully? He's a hero. So pilots should stop, people should stop saying pilots don't do much. When you see this film, you know, my pilot, people say pilots don't do much because when I give permission for anybody to visit the cockpit and I allow him to get in, when I'm not busy at all, not doing anything, when we're busy, we don't let people get in the cockpit. So that's why people say, we get inside, the captain is sitting, uh, having his coffee, he's not doing anything. Okay, I don't invite anybody when I'm busy, I'm doing so. This is the idea, people think we don't do much. Is it dangerous? No. Planes crash because of technical problem? Yes, anything can fail. There is no zero risk in life. This does not exist. We try to reduce the risk from 50% to 40 to 30 to 20, but uh, we cannot get it to zero in anything in life. Walking, driving, moving, eating, whatever. Risk exists. But uh, in modern aviation now, the risk has its minimum. At minimum risk in the fly. Is it safer to drive than to fly? Let's look at this. These are statistics. Commercial aviation is the most scrutinized, investigated, and monitored form of transportation. There is no other form of transportation that's being monitored, audited as flight. Nothing else. So study over 15 years, and the fatal risk per flight was one in seven million. It's one in seven million. So if you fly every day, and that indicates 19,000 years before you face a fatal accident. If you fly every day, the probability from now until 19,000 years, you face a fatal accident. Where are the chances of dying of a train is one in a million. Flying is one in seven million. You are most likely to die of a bee sting than of flying. And whenever you fly, we have 100,000 of a percent, 0 0.00 of dying. Look at the right side, death by other odds. Heart problems, one in two. That's the risk. Smoking is one in 600 chances that we die. Car trip is 1 in 14,000. Bicycle accident, 1 in 88,000. Tornado, 1 in 450,000. Train, coast to coast, 1 in a million. Lightning, beasting, and you get, at the end, US commercial jet airline, 1 in 7 million. And that source is Massachusetts Institute of Technology in California. So it's not a rumor that flying is the safest way of transportation. This is a fact. This is a fact. With the modern technology, the modern protection, the modern training and checking of pilots, the recurrent training, the new engines coming that an engine might fail once every 100 years. Statistics. So all the components of aircrafts don't fail regularly. I flew 46 years, 45 years. I didn't have one technical failure. What we face sometimes, very little technical failures, very little, but then person gets scared. Oh my God, it's delayed, there's a technical problem. If the switch that I switch on, seat belt on and seat belt off, if that is broken, I'm not allowed to depart, I'm not allowed to fly. So this has nothing to do with safety. So people get scared. Oh, we have delay. We have tech. Captain said we have technical problem. We're going to delay half an hour. I cannot fly if I don't have the switch setting seat belt on, seat belt off. It doesn't mean the aircraft has a broken wing or broken wing. 
I never faced really something serious technical. Have you? Very little. Very little. Very little. So flying is safe. Please buy tickets and fly Middle East Airlines. <laughs> we need to fly with us. Excuse me. Conditions are? Uh, a condition in the cockpit and in the aircraft. Ayara? A condition is off? Never. No air condition. Aircraft cannot fly without air condition. There's a lot of system and computers but yeah, that has to be cooled all the time. We cannot fly even if I don't have passengers, we need the air conditioning system. All the electrical system, but the air and the computer has to be cooled. So even with no passenger, we don't fly without air condition. Now, let's jump to future of aviation. Future of what will happen in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. These are pictures of, if anybody remembers, Fayrouz. This is Fayrouz here. Asr Rehbain, the old days, one day flew with us. So what are experts and engineers thinking promoting aviation for the future? Yeah. A key first, first thing they think about is safety. So they talk at the beginning about safety. Okay, comfort of passengers is important, but safety comes first. So talking about safety, they're going for more more powerful engine, more reliable engines, more protection in the aircraft so pilots don't do mistakes, so aircraft doesn't allow pilots to do mistake. If I want to take an airplane straight ahead to a mountain, the aircraft will not go. It will not go. If I want to turn the aircraft like this, it will not turn. If I want to take the nose of the aircraft up like this, which is not safe, it will not go, and all these things. So they're going for safety issues, for more protections, so human beings do mistakes. Pilots do mistakes like anybody else, anybody who works do mistakes. So we're trying to find more protections, much more than we have now, to protect aircraft and passengers. So this is talking safety. With more reliable engines, better body, lighter probably. And then we have, they have to fly higher. We have to fly higher in the future because the airspace is crowded. Like Beirut when you drive. It's crowded, they have to go higher. Once we go higher, we can go faster. And this is what flying is all about, to go faster. Nowadays, we fly subsonic. We fly less than speed of sound. If you've heard of supersonic, like the Concorde, that aircraft flies more than the speed of sound, twice or three times more. They have in the future to go higher and go faster because we're getting bored flying from here to New York for 10, 12 hours. I want to be there in three or four hours. So that will go in the future. But that it takes a new design, a new body, and new engines to be able to take the aircraft up to that high altitudes and the body to take the, the pressure they have at that altitude. This will be the future on top of fuel. Now very soon we're getting new engines that save 15% of fuel consumption. Do you know how many million tons of kerosene is burned by aircraft above us? Millions every day of fuel is being burned and millions of tons of carbon dioxide in the sky. So the future, apart from safety, is eco-friendly. We have to care about the environment and very soon we'll pay tax, tax, when we fly in the airspace of any country for polluting their airspace. For polluting their airspace. So they will go eco-friendly in finding a way Electrical, they still cannot invent electrical engines. They still have the jet engine on the fuel, but they find a way of reducing the combustion and the pollution of the atmosphere in carbon dioxide. So this is the future. Concerning your, your comfort, you can buy a ticket like this. <laughs> that's, that's a full room from you, and uh, that will be Dubai, London, $35,000 a ticket. To fly. Thank you for flying me today. 
and this is me and, uh, and Madame in the simulator at the beginning when they had it. And these are two my daughters because they wanted to see what is the simulator. Yes. Thank you very much. Now we're ready for any questions. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Of, yeah. So what? So this is a reason because of what? Because of the airplane being so old or low maintenance or what? That's a technical failure. This is a technical failure. That is a technical failure that might happen. Well, the reasons why it could be old airplane, it could be bad maintenance, could be whatever by design, fatigue of the engine, things can happen. Well, these things happen once every, every 50 years. I've never heard, never heard of, of an engine being like a separated in flight and opening a window and, and somebody getting outside. But things might happen. That's why when, when we fly, we have to choose which airline we fly with. <laughs> you have to choose which airline. You don't go to any supermarket. You don't go to any mall. You don't go to any university, right? Okay? You don't go to any university to study. You don't go to any mall, to any supermarket. You go to places that you trust and you know. So when you fly, you have to choose your airline. That airline you talked about, I've never heard about. But let, let, let me first just interrupt the question and say, I want to thank an extremely remarkable captain whom I flew for 10 years as a co-pilot. And I learned a lot from him. I'm very grateful to you, Captain Josad. <laughs> he taught me how to fly. Oh, yeah. oh, Next. My question, uh, thanks for a very interesting lecture in the first place. And then my question is, what is the difference between flying a helicopter, between flying this uh, uh, passenger flight, uh, flying a commercial uh, flight for luggage only, I mean for uh, transporting goods, yeah. and uh, the uh, military military flights, and how do they get, uh, uh, while flying, they get fuel and uh, connect with other flights? Yeah, I got you. Thank uh, you. Com commercial airlines, we have passenger, we have cargo, it's the same airplane. Cargo and passenger, they are the same airplane, same pilot, same flight. Okay, helicopters are different. Helicopters are not commercial. I cannot go in a helicopter from here to London or to New York. Helicopter only for local flying. Cannot carry 500 passengers. They don't have enough fuel. It doesn't fly so much high, so it's a different type of airplane. It's not used commercially. Take off and uh, landing the same? No. No, helicopters. Uh, I expected somebody to say, when we talk about the wings, that somebody would say, okay, helicopters don't have wings. How do they fly? So that rotor above the helicopter uh, acts like wings for the helicopter. That takes it up and lifts it off the ground. But helicopters are not made commercial flight that carries passengers from one country to another. Now we have flights for 15, 16, 18 hours of commercial flights. Helicopters cannot do this. It's only for local domestic inside. Uh, fighters, they're different airplane. They're different airplane. The objective of fighters are different. They fly to kill. We fly to save. So, 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 so it's different mentality. It's different mentality. When you see that, that fighter aircraft doing all this, I cannot do this with you when you fly. You never fly. So we're under strict rules and regulations different from the military. And remember, military don't have too much experience here. They spend 20 years uh, flying. All they accumulate is 500 hours. We have 25,000 hours of flying. They don't fly in bad weather, military. They never. So they fly like half an hour, they come back. They don't care about uh, uh, being uh, comfort with passengers and all these things. And they fly anywhere they want. We're under strict rules and regulation. We cannot do so. It's different objective and mentality from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As a pilot, uh, how do you have a special passport? No, I have to have a valid passport. I have to have a valid license. 
and I have a valid ID. So a valid ID, a valid license, and a valid passport, but I don't stamp my passport. Our passport is not stamped every time we fly. We don't need visas. We don't need visas. We carry a paper, they call it general declaration. It's a declaration that the captain will sign that I have with me the rest of the crew, first officer, so on, so on, is or cabin attendant. I will sign it. I'll give it to immigration. They will sign it. They give it to me. When I leave the country, I give them back to you. Back to them. That's all. But we don't stamp our passports, except in very few odd places that require visas. The whole crew, eh, we don't need visas, no. Thank you for the lecture. Thank you, dear. Are we, are we buying new airplanes in the Middle East? Is there an accident? Airplanes? 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 Crash? Crash? Airplanes? Yeah, any accidents happen in Middle East Airlines? Yeah. I mean, crash? Every airline had an incident one time. You cannot fly a hundred of years with no incidents. The last incident we had in Middle East was in 1976. In 1976, over Saudi Arabia. And uh, most probably it was hit by a fighter, by mistake. A fighter airplane hit a Boeing 720 and crashed over Saudi Arabia in 1976. Yes. You talked about the rigor and extreme uh, care in selecting pilots and so on. Yet, just a couple of years ago, this Malaysian guy took the plane down in the, the sea, the Malaysian Airlines. And also a couple of years ago, a guy flew into a mountain uh, somewhere in Europe. Uh, how can these people escape these very rigorous selection procedure. Yeah, about the Malaysian, I don't know the result, but I know about the German wings that co pilot that flew the aircraft to the mountain. Okay, after that accident, they're doing more strict medical examination mentally. Mentally. Now, when I come to EB once a year to do my medical check, I go on stress test, so echo, whatever, or x rays, or blood, or whatever, but there was no check of mental. So after the German wing accidents, all the airlines are just going for mental checking of pilots also. And, and just a recent uh, report says that uh, an Indian airline, uh, the pilot intended to take it down. That, that was still not, 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 not final decision, not, not final decision about the, about the report. That they got. Yeah, yeah. That was speculation that what happened, but, but what happened was the German wings was actual. The final report came that the captain was locked outside, and the copilot did not open the door for him, so he was alone in the cockpit and he crashed the airplane. From that on, the regulation, one pilot is not allowed to stay alone in the cockpit. So every time the captain leaves the cockpit, somebody from the cabin crew must come inside and stay with the other pilot. So if he decided to unlock the door and don't let the captain come back, there's somebody else there. So rules international, one pilot is not allowed to be left alone in the cockpit after that incident. And they're going for more strict checking of mental situation of pilots also. But you know, sometimes people go crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Take off and into space. You mean vertical takeoff and landing? What's the difference? What's the difference? You save the space. Yeah. You need such big, huge engines to lift that aircraft 500 tons of weight. There are some fighters of them, the Jaguar or Spitfire or whatever they can do, but that aircraft, fighter aircraft is very light. So to lift a 747 or the 380 now is 1,000 passengers, 500 tons of weight. You need maybe 100 engines to lift it off. So engineering-wise cannot be done so far. 
If they can do it, they'll do it, yeah. They'll save all these uh, large areas of airports or runways or whatever. So it's a matter of technology. It's a matter of technology, yes. It's a matter of technology. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank you I for it. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was wonderful. Uh, question for you. What happens when a, a plane disappears and no one knows what happened to it? How is that possible? This, this doesn't happen often. It happens with the Malaysian. Some of you talk about it. And up till now, they're still investigating. They don't know. They don't know. The late, late date was captain took it somewhere and he landed somewhere. And the airplane is still somewhere landing in China or somewhere like because they didn't find it. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's really amazing. But you know, something falls down in, in, in the ocean. It's not easy to find it. And oceans are so wide and so big, and they go deep down five, six kilometers, and mountains down there. And so it's not easy to find an airplane if it sinks in, in, in an ocean. But if you're talking about the Malaysian one, the latest report I've read, it could be recorded the pilots inside took the airplane somewhere. That's what they said. They stopped searching. They will stop searching as of next week. They stop French. Well, they, they stopped searching for it. Yeah. Well, they searched the whole uh, ocean. They didn't find it. You, UFO maybe. UFO took it up there somewhere. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank for you. This, uh, Pleasure. Amazing lecture. Thank you. you mentioned about navigation in yeah. the sky. We didn't know how to navigate. How, how do you know your yeah. uh, uh, road fly? And uh, what about the bad weather? What do you do when it is very bad weather in the sky? Now, navigation. Yes, Tabbet. Fin Tabbet, I'll tell you about Navigation, of course, we have charts, we have routes that I fly. Fi Tari, Bim Shalai. And my route that I fly, the road, is 10 miles in width. So I have charts that I follow to take me from Beirut to London, or Beirut to Frankfurt, Beirut to Dubai. I follow routes. Now, in the earlier days, we needed instruments found on ground that can operate my navigation instruments in the cockpit. One instrument is here at AUB. If you see a big antenna down there on the out of AUB, this is non-directional beacon, which sends some information to my instrument in the cockpit, so I can know where is Beirut. There are instruments in Khaldi, there are instruments in Shekka, so these are everywhere. Now with the modern technology, probably very soon, we don't need all this. It's by GPS. We don't need any all this. An aircraft can fly from here around the world 40 hours without any help from any ground equipment. It's, it's by using GPS. And if I tell the aircraft, go from this point to this point, it will go taking coordinates of longitude and latitude, so every point on Earth is defined by these coordinates. So if I tell my auto flight system to fly from this point to this point, it will go without mistakes, without using any equipment used on ground. So this is how we navigate. And then every airport for departure has its charts. Every airport has different charts. Every landing at an airport has different charts. We have 45 charts when we land in London. There are 60 charts if I want to land in Frankfurt. For the airport itself, not on route. Same on a depart. So we have something in hand as charts to follow. And that was called instrument flying, that we fly without looking outside, just looking inside by instruments and navigating. Yeah, bad, bad weather, bad weather. There is always weather. But there is no air in the air. There is no air in the air. The aircraft doesn't lose altitude. But the aircraft is made to be flexible. It is made to be flexible. Sometimes the atmosphere is very smooth and calm, like when you look at the sea, the bahar. You see a boat standing without moving. And sometimes you see the waves, and the boat is moving like this. So this is what the airplane is made to do. She moves with the waves. It's flexible, otherwise it will break. So it's flexible, like your car is flexible. So sometimes the atmosphere is so quiet and calm, 
so we don't feel any turbulence. Sometimes change of temperature, change of wind direction, change of whatever things. There are waves in the atmosphere, and the aircraft will ride the waves. Because if you try to fight these waves, you break the aircraft. So it's made to be flexible. And if you see a wing sometimes moving like this, a wing to break has to go up 17 meters. You yeah, the height of three or four floors before the wing breaks. The maximum you see it moving is something like this, so don't be scared. <laughs> Turbulence is safe. Turbulence is safe. Not even once airplane was lost because of turbulence. So don't be scared. Yeah, you're asking about char charter flight. Charter, planes, charter. Yeah. like wings of Lebanon or Oran, O-flight. Yeah, I don't want to mention names, not names, but a key charter airplane doesn't have experience as Middle East Airlines. We were flying for 73 years. So be careful when you fly with charter airplanes, that's all I say. I don't have to mention names, I probably they're excellent. But then if you fly with KLM, if you fly with British Airways, if you fly with Air France, if you fly with the Middle East Airline, these are companies that we fly. Do they have the same uh, license? Yeah, you have to get the license. But where they do their training, I don't know. Who teaches them, who trains them, who does, I don't know. Anti-terrorist training. Actually, no. They found out. They found out. They found out. You know, we don't want terrorists to reach the aircraft. Once they have to reach to the aircraft, we're not in good situation. The rule now: he has. They have to stop him before he gets to the airport. Yes. Thank you for coming. I, I didn't get to you. And do you know how many? I, I didn't get to you. No. I, I, didn't, I didn't get you. She said, I so, Sorry? Yeah, yes, please. Yes, uh, what's your personal uh, opinion about UFOs and buried attacks? About UFOs and? Your personal opinion about UFOs and buried attacks. Yeah, UFOs? UFOs and Bermuda attacks. Bermuda, Bermuda is a khabari. Bermuda is a khabari, you don't believe it. It happened that, it happened, incident happened at that area, people were afraid. But we flew so many times there, so nothing happened, don't worry. It's not a fact, it's a myth, yeah. Now, UFOs, we've seen falling stars, we see like this one, we fly at night. But UFOs, no. No. I don't know if they really exist, yeah. It's fake, yeah, no, it's not good. No. It's, not, it's not true, no, it's not true. No, it's not true, no. It's not true. So fly to Bermuda, there's no problem, no. Shukran, Mohammed. Shukran, like up to now, there is nothing proven. Nobody proved that these you would exist. There is no proof that they exist, UFOs. Hey, people say, oh, no, I saw something at night or whatever, and then the government starts investigating, but they never reach a place where they said, yeah, they do exist. There might be something from outer space, I don't know. But we flew for uh, 45 years up there, we've never seen anybody. <laughs> if they are Tejassos or whatever, uh, it's not my feeling. But 
نيفر بروفن ولا بمحل انه يو فو اكزيست شو هيك كابتن؟ نيفر هيك ناس بتشوف شغلات وذي توك اباوت ات Do you foresee a time and how soon uh, where robots will replace pilots? Yeah, very soon. Very soon. My friend, they can send, yeah, they can send machines to the moon without pilots. They can do this technically, but we are there for your comfort and for your safety that robots cannot do. They can set an airplane in normal situation, yes, by remote control from here to anywhere. But who will act if something happens? We are there to act if something abnormal happens. Like we talked about the whole training, yeah, robots don't think. Correct? But they can send it without pilots, yes, they can do this engineer. It's easier for them now. The space shuttles are mitla or marif or amadar with no pilots, and they come back. How stiff uh, to turn a bit over Syria nowadays? We, we, we never stopped flying over Syria, nothing happened. Yeah, there is a restriction on the level, yes. But now it's finished, it's not no danger anymore. Probably the, the first time when, when Syria war started, probably there was some kind of danger, but now there is nothing anymore. But we're restricted to a certain level, yes. We never fly over Syria below 32,000 feet. International rules which not out there on them. It, it, it was both. It was both. Yeah, I'm talking about Sophia. It was both. It was a really severe bad weather. Probably other pilots could have survived. We, we don't know. But yes, I think there was mistakes from the pilots at that day. When we say pilots' mistakes, pilots don't do intentional mistakes. They don't intend to do the mistakes. Okay? Matar ma bata talimat. We we fly the airplane. Matar ma bata talimat. The air traffic controller doesn't give anything to pilots. I don't know why people think you know I'm up there flying and the air traffic control. He's holding my hand and taking me from here to, to, to Dubai. No. He is a traffic controller. Police Ishar al Majud al We fly the airplane, you drive your cars only. He doesn't fly, he doesn't know. There are hundreds of planes flying. You think this guy, the air traffic control, he knows the Airbus 320, 21, or 747, or Boeing, or Jumbo, V610, V610. He studied all these airplanes. No. He's only traffic coordinator, that's all. I cannot do a takeoff and go climb and fly a certain level, I need clearance from him. I need a clearance to do the takeoff, or is there somebody else? I cannot land without his clearance, or if somebody is on the runway. So this is what we get from the air traffic control, apart from weather information about the airport. Because they don't fly airplanes, we fly the airplanes. Yeah, I can get it. Madam. Can we do Shari El Mardi? Can we do Shari El Mardi Matula? But to answer your question, it says pilots must not be at stress. Pilots must not be at stress. They must avoid conflicts or any mind distraction. <laughs> so their family life, please listen, the family life is very important. For the support of this. We are not allowed by law to go and fly the airplane if you're sick. We're not allowed to go if you're under stress. If you make a conflict with my wife, Damiri, huh? It's not allowed. So pilots have to choose carefully with their wives to have, a, to have a very peaceful and joyful and very calm home. Thank you for the question. Yes. Yeah. Most of the pilots that did, when they say pilots mistake by investigation, they found, yes, he has previous problems at home, financial, emotional, or whatever. 
family problems, yes. Hi. Hi, hi. <laughs> hi, hi. It's you, it's you. You're not your daughter. Would you have done the same thing as Captain Sully if your aircraft was landing in the Hudson? Uh, would, would I do the same? Would you have landed in the Hudson? Yeah. This guy is a hero. This never happened in history. Never happened in history. The captain lands an airplane with 155 passengers in water with no single injury. And if he decided to go back, probably through the saw the film. If he had decided to go back to the airport, he would have crashed before. He had no engines, so he had no control. The record was going like this. So if he turned to land at Tetherbow, the closest airport, he would have landed before. So he elected to land in water. And if you saw the film, all the insurance companies were trying to blame him because they went to the simulator and they proved to him, yes, he could have turned and landed in New York again. And then you know what happened at the end. He said, you know what you're, you're seeing. I was, I was astonished what happened to me. I didn't have too much time to think like you. And I landed there. But he's a hero. This never happened before. You know, Barlow Maris man of the Yara that lands in water and stays intact, didn't break, will, all passengers are safe. So he's really a hero. Pilots who flew Middle East Airlines, they are all, all heroes. We flew, we flew in times in Lebanon 1975 between rockets. We landed in Beirut with no lights at the airport. We took off with no lights at the airport. We landed, we're being shelled by bombs and all the bombs. We are heroes. But, uh, I'm not sure if the are going to be able to get the car. I'm not sure if they are going to be able to get the car. I'm not sure if they are going to be able to get the car. Be special people at every airport to deal with birds to keep them away. In Beirut, we had Costa Brava. We tried to talk, yes, it's sometimes dangerous. Because engines are designed, are designed to, to take certain certain amount of birds, but not 50 birds. Okay, by design, when we talk to Airbus, yes, the engine can take a couple of birds with a certain weight. Before it like in the show. But uh, if you face like that film that we saw with hundreds of birds, that, that could be dangerous. So we consulted people in London, Frankfurt, Geneva. They came here. And now the problem is solved. We have some time of rules and regulation for pilots, how high we fly above, above Costa Brava, don't get below. And uh, they had something like uh, inserted all over the airport machine that gives uh, something to, to just uh, for, for all the birds to escape. And we don't see them anymore. And we've never been hit by a bird in Kohanman or in Costa Brava. So it's, it's safe so far. Last question, I'm going to ask it. Yes, dear. Uh, I'd like to ask you about Burj Al Mara'abi, yeah. the main control at the airport, uh, our airport. Uh, we hear in the news that uh, there's something dangerous, there's lack of number of uh, opera operators. So what's the real situation here? خليك انا مني اضرب كانوا من وين؟ خليك انا مضربين امبارح اضربوا ساعه واليوم مضربين ساعه بطالب مثل من اللايك ذا تيشرت ولبنان مع المين مع الميت وسلسله الرتب اور وات ايفر ذي تو بي بارت اوف ذيس يعني بس بس عم بيقولوا انه في نقص لا لا ما في نقص البرسونال لا براذر ذير از شورتج سام وير بات نوت ذا اير ان ذا اير ترافيك كنترول نوت ان ذيس بارت اوف ذا اير ترافيك كنترول نو ذا ذيس ويل اير بروبلي اذر اذر اوفيسز اذر بليسز يس بات فور ذا اير ترافيك كنترولرز نو Anyway, Beirut Airport is not so busy. It's not so that busy airport. Mm. So we have enough air traffic controllers, I know them. They get to do some ground courses with us. Don't okay, worry. thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.